It's great to be here to talk about uh, our efforts on performance prediction for distributed cloud applications. So the core concept behind performance prediction is actually quite simple. Right? Imagine you have this magical function f, and then you give it some input of some uh, system states and some uh, workload characteristics, and then it's going to try to predict what would be the likely system performance of some metric. Right. One example of such metric would be the end-to-end -end user request latency. And the goal here is try to find a cost-efficient way to construct this uh, f, this function f, which is also known as performance modeling. So one common question, right, is why do we need to predict for end-to-end -end performance? Right? And the capability of doing the capability to do so will allow us to do uh, performance optimization, capacity planning, and SLO pla uh, uh, scheduling. And the, the running scenario uh, in our paper is on performance auto tuning, which is showing in the figure below. Right. So you can see that in the middle is the performance model, and we coupled it with the optimizer. And the optimizer will try to find a global optimal in the modeled performance space. And that global optimal becomes the best system configuration knobs that you should use. And one thing to know is that the system can, can give us feedback which allow us to further construct or, or improve the performance model. So one emerging practice is to apply machine learning techniques to performance modeling. And there are two reasons behind it. First of all, training data sets are readily available from running system benchmarks. And second of all, there are many off-the-shelf machine learning tools that can help us to train and also to deploy large models. So over the years, right, we have seen a lot of efforts demonstrate the feasibility and also the potential of applying machine learning to performance modeling. The system, their system uh, uh, scenarios range from databases to cloud VMs to scheduler, and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that it's actually getting more and more difficult to maintain these performance models, especially for cloud applications, such as microservice-based applications. So let me take a step back and talk about microservice applications. They are very different from the traditional monolithic applications. So as you can see from the figure below, they are composed of distributed services. So imagine right, you have a re user request coming in. That request is going to traverse a set of services. And then collectively, those services are going to contribute to the end-to-end -end performance. And uh, what's even more important is that these services are loosely coupled. So services can be independently upgraded, replaced, scaled. And this is why cloud applications are increasingly scalable and also increasingly dynamic. And this becomes a problem for performance modeling. Because you have to make sure that your model can actually keep up with that scale and also with that dynamics. So when I talk about scale, I was referring to the large number of knobs and states that you have to model. And then, uh, so for example, from our experience, if your application has, let's say, 150 services, then you, you are pushing the model inputs to beyond 1,000, okay? And then this becomes a really high-dimensional model, right? And I'm not saying that the current machine learning toolkits cannot handle this high-dimensional model, but what I'm saying is, uh, you need a lot of data points to train such a large model, and that is going to take a lot of time. Not to mention that microservices, uh, sorry, not to mention that microservices are really dynamic. And what this means is whatever performance model that you just trained will most likely be invalidated in the future. And when that happens, you have to redesign and retrain, right? For example, if you add or remove services in the deployment, then you have, the, then basically you need a new performance model with a different model input dimension, right? Because you have different number of services now. If the model drifts from the deployment behavior, you have to retrain. Again, redesigning, uh, retraining, these are very time consuming tasks. So, um, 
in thinking about the solution, right, we realized that maybe the problem is not to build a faster machine learning pipeline. Maybe the problem is how we should approach performance modeling for distributed cloud applications. And these cloud applications, they are really scalable in dynamics because they heavily leverage the principle of modularity. So the problem here is, can we also apply the principle of modularity to performance modeling? So if so, right, then we can, um, we can actually isolate changes to affected region uh, in the model instead of retraining the whole model. And that can actually save us a lot of overhead and also time. Yeah. So intuitively, right, such a modularized learning would probably take the following three steps. So intuitively, first of all, we need to model these uh, services independently. And then we get a lot of these services level performance models. And then somehow we assemble them in a way that represents the end-to-end -end application. Okay. And then whenever the deployment changes, right, for example, add or remove services, then we can simply reassemble those service level performance models. So these three steps are quite intuitive, but they are design considerations behind them. First of all, we, how, how, how can we assemble heterogeneous services which are possibly be modeled by different machine learning models? So uh, the first consideration is, can we actually design a consistent interface that allows us to assemble these services, these uh, performance models? Right? And then once we can do that, can we actually have some kind of criteria to guide us on how to assemble them? to match the deployment setup. Okay. And then whenever the deployment changes, we also need some guidance on how to reassemble our uh, uh, models in order to adapt to the new deployment setup. Okay. So Fluxion is our framework to systematically realize modularized learning. And uh, it introduces two abstractions the first one is called learning assignment, and the second one is the inference graph. So let's talk about inf uh, the learning assignment first. So learning assignment, uh, in our mind, is the basic unit in performance modeling. And what it does is it models one performance matrix of one service. For example, you can have one assignment that models the P90 latency of a service. And its interface exposes uh, two types of inputs. Uh, the first one is what we call the service internal properties. This includes the service states, the service workload characteristics. Um, and then the second input type is what we call the external performance dependencies. So this allows, allows uh, this assignment to consider the child service's performance. Okay. And the assignment output would be the performance prediction. And inside the assignment are machine learning models. Right? And then uh, Fluxium is agnostic to specific modeling techniques. And each assignment can host multiple models. And this allows us to capture the temporal uh, patterns, for example, weekdays and also weekend. Okay. So let me talk more about uh, the assignment inputs. Okay. So assignment has a mechanism called input selection. And uh, its goal is to reduce external performance dependencies. Right? And the, the, the observation here is that not all performance dependencies are equally important. So for example, if you want to predict for the high percentile latency, maybe the low percentile latencies are not that important uh, to do this, to do this uh, prediction. Right? So, so uh, uh, the the uh, input selection happens after the assignment is instantiated, but before the models are uh, trained. And the paper presents an implementation that is based on Thompson sampling with beta distribution. For outputs, the assignment has a mechanism called output weighting, and its goal is to aggregate uh, the output of all models inside the assignment. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, this actually enables to capture the, the temporal pattern 
for example, we, we can have the weekday models and also the weekend models. And then you, depending on the, on the time of, of, uh, of the week, day of the week, you can actually assign different weights to different models. Right? That's just one example. And the weights are recomputed whenever we see the assignment prediction accuracy drops, or we can do this periodically. And the paper presents an implementation that is based on differential evolution. So now we have assignment abstraction. Now we can start to build the next, ab uh, next uh, abstraction level, the, the inference graph. So just like system deployment is a graph of interconnected services, the inference graph is a graph of interconnected learning assignments. And the graph has uh, vertices. Uh, the first one we call the instance vertices. Right? These match each service instance in the deployment. Right? So one service instance in the deployment, we would need one uh, instance vertices. Right? And some services are actually scaled out. So uh, we need to aggregate them, just like a load balancer, we need to aggregate them with, with something called a service vertices. Right? And the edges allow us to satisfy the external performance dependencies by wearing up uh, those dependencies to another assignment's output. Okay. So to visualize the graph construction, that's considered a really small 14-service uh, application. Okay. So the first step here is to add those uh, instance vertices. Right? So again, each service instance in the deployment would have one instance vertices here. Okay. And then these instance vertices would host the learning assignment that we just mentioned. Okay. So some services uh, are scaled out, such as the, the uh, recommend service here. Uh, we scaled it out to two instance. In this case, we need to aggregate those two instance. So that's why we add a green box which represents the service vertex. Okay. And the final step is to follow the service dependency in the deployment and then we start to add the directed, directed edge uh, among these uh, vertices. Right? So now we have a complete graph uh, that represents the end-to-end -end application. Now we can actually use it to do prediction for the end-to-end -end performance. Okay? And the inferencing starts from the top leaves. Right? And then what happens is we start to execute the assignment inside these uh, leaves. And then the assignment outputs will be propagated down to the next level of vertices. And then so on and so forth until we reach the, uh, the bottom root. And the root output would be the end-to-end -end performance prediction. So when, 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 the, when the deployment changes, we also need to update this inference graph in order to match the deployment setup. So for example, Whenever we add or remove services, then we also have to replace, uh, sorry, we also have to add or remove assignments to, to, the, to the graph. Whenever we update or replace the service, then we have to replace the corresponding assignments or, ver or vertices uh, in the graph. Okay. And in most cases, that reassembly is probably all, all you need to do, right? But then in very unlikely events, right, uh, you might need to do some retraining. And then in the paper, we also uh, discuss a debugging uh, mechanism that allows us to do the training. Okay. So to evaluate uh, Fluxium, uh, we use three microservice uh, applications. Uh, they are publicly uh, available. Uh, these three applications, they vary in the, in the number of services and also in the number of knobs and states that we have to model. Uh, we in, we uh, periodically we introduce uh, deployment changes into them, and then this is based on uh, orchestration, different orchestration uh, operations. Uh, for example, we have what's called the automated orchestration. This is where we stress the application so much that we trigger Kubernetes to auto scale some services, and we also have manual orchestration operations. Uh, for example, where we manually scale out the entire application. And finally, we can also replace service. For example, database is a very nice example where you can actually switch out the database for another type of database. Okay. 
And, and uh, the goal here is to see how the performance model would behave or react in the presence of these uh, uh, deployment changes. So the baseline we use are, um, are Gaussian process and also DNN uh, performance models. And we use two evaluation metrics. One is to evaluate how well the performance model can, can predict the performance. Right? This is, and we use the MAE uh, as the metric. Uh, it, it's called mean absolute error. And, we, and also in the uh, scenario of auto-tuning, we also try to quantify how much the, each performance model can help the application to improve its performance. Okay. So uh, due to the time constraint, right, I'm going to talk about one application, which is the, the train ticket. And if you look at the, the x-axis, the x-axis uh, is time. And you can see that we divide the, the figure into seven distinct uh, time periods. And each time period, we introduce one particular deployment change. So for example, uh, we start with the initial deployment, and then uh, it has 49 services, and then we start to stress the application so much that Kubernetes start to scale out certain services, for example, the station service. And then uh, the route service is scaled as well, and the, the order service. And then we also manually scale out all services uh, by three times. Uh, and this gives us 105 services in our cluster. And uh, finally, we, we replaced MySQL with TIDB. So during this time, right, we calculate the, the, uh, the MAE for Flaxium and also for baseline. And empirical results shows that Flaxium has a much lower MAE than the, than, than the baseline. And one interesting observation is that at the beginning of each time period, the MAE reduction is always higher. And this is because Fluxion doesn't need to do um, very, uh, much uh, retraining. It just need to reassemble the models. And that's why the MAE can actually stay very, very low. Right? And then for the baseline, you have to retrain. You have to redesign. Okay. And very quickly, uh, in terms of the uh, P90 latency speed up, this is, this is in the uh, auto-tuning scenario, we see that having a better performance model is going to improve the, the application performance. So for example, compared to the baseline, we can actually further reduce the P90 latency by 1.4 uh, uh, times. And then compared to the default application without any auto-tuning, -tune, the, the improvement is 1.78. So in conclusion, right, Fluxion is a framework to systematically realize modularized learning. And Fluxion is a part of our long-term effort to make system learning friendly. And we realize that this actually goes beyond using off-the-shelf machine learning tools. And uh, we hope that system principles can help just like how we used the, 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 the principle of modularity. Uh, having said that, uh, I'm happy to take questions.